about a uh, uh, trip I took this summer. I took three students to an event called Mothapalooza in, uh, in Ohio. So if you like moths, you can go to Mothapalooza in the summer. Uh, and we were going there, but I had to stop and give a talk in um, Columbus, Ohio on the way. So the students are just kind of hanging out and, and get, in, get into the room. A lot of people there. And one student says, is this a conference? And I said, no, it's just me. And he looked at me and said, these people are here just for you? <laughs> Louder. 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 Well, how do I do that? Is this OK? I've got it. I've got it on. But. So is this working? All right. No more stories about Martha Palooza. Um, Eleanor said, uh, talk about why managing road size for, for wildflowers is important. Uh, and I thought about that. And I really can't answer that question unless I talk about uh, why nature is important, why it matters that we save nature. Wildflowers are part of it. And we're not just going to save one part. We have to save all the parts. Um, so I'm going to talk about road size a little bit. You're going to hear a lot about road size from other people. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, more or less the, the bigger picture. We need to save all parts of nature pretty much everywhere. But before we do that, let's talk about box turtles. Eastern box turtle, common eastern box turtle. Uh, not so common anymore, um, but uh, many of us have run into these, particularly when we were young. Typically, we see them in a field. We always think they're denizens of old fields. Uh, but in fact, they spend most of their time in the woods. And most of the time, they spend buried beneath ve vegetation in the woods. But in the springtime, they, they go according. And if that's successful, uh, the female, that's when she leaves the woods. She's going to lay her eggs. She digs a hole, lays her eggs. Uh, and, and she wants the sun to incubate those eggs. So she's got to find a sunny patch outside of the woods. Well, those eggs hatch into little baby box turtles. Uh, but we don't see them because they spend sometimes up to a year underground. And nobody knows what they're, they're doing. The only reason I ran into this guy is I was digging a hole to plant a tree, and up he came. Um, sometimes we see small box turtles uh, later on. But typically, by the, by the time we see them again, they're almost mature, and they're back in, in the woods. Now, they have a life history very similar to ours. They're uh, well into their teens before they reproduce. Uh, and they live 70 to 80 years without any problem at all. So um, think of them as, as like Uncle Joe there. This is the University of Delaware Woodlot. Call it Ecology Woods. It's 35 acres. Uh, and there was a man, uh, a formal faculty member, uh, back in 1968 who decided he wanted to study box turtles. So he caught every box turtle he could find in the woodlot and marked them all so he could recognize them later on. And there were 91 box turtles in the woodlot way back in 1968. Well, the woodlot is a typical urban forest fragment. It is surrounded on all sides by, by human activity. Um, used to be surrounded entirely by agriculture. It's been isolated for over 100 years. Uh, now it's, it's surrounded by agriculture and athletic fields. And to the south, there is a four-lane highway and then, then suburbia. If we stand back even further, up in the corner there, you see another little woodlot, Webb Farm, and down, down, to, the, uh, down to the right, um, Iron Hill Park. So there are other patches of woods around, and they have box turtles in them too. But there's no ability for these turtles to, to mix. Uh, because if they go outside of the woodlot, it's really dangerous. They either get plowed or they get mowed. But most often, they get squished. And yes, I have a picture of a squished box turtle, but I've learned I shouldn't show that. Uh, and that's why uh, in 1968, there were 91 box turtles. In 2001, there were 21 box turtles in the woodlot. And in 2010, there were 12. Uh, and that's when the study ended. Nobody's following them anymore. But you see what's happening. They are, we call this realizing their extinction debt. The death rate far exceeds the birth rate in the woodlot. And pretty soon, they will disappear. Now, the important thing here, notice it's taken a long time for these turtles to disappear. So a lot of people will fragment a habitat, and then they go in the next year, and they say, oh, look, these things are here. Fragmentation didn't hurt them. Well, you have to look at them over a long period of time uh, because typically it, it does hurt them. And it's not just box turtles that are disappearing. All of the amphibians that are out and about are suffering from uh, the effects of fragmentation. Same thing with reptiles. And even a number of insects, believe it or not. This is a large flightless carabid beetle, uh, so it can't fly. 
1975, there was a good population of these guys in the woodlot where the box turtles were. Uh, in 2005, they were extinct. So even 35 acres is not big enough to maintain a population of, of these beetles. Uh, and that is, that is the point I'm trying to make here, that biodiversity cannot be sustained in habitat fragments because they're too small and they're too isolated. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat fragment, and it doesn't have to be nearly that small, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. So even if you don't go outside the woodlot and get squished, the fact that you're a small population is a serious problem because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. So the top line there, the dark blue line, uh, is a large population. And even in its down cycle, there's enough individuals so that when times get better, it can increase quickly again. But the bottom population, the tiny little population there, often natural fluctuations means it hits zero in its little habitat. It blinks out. There's an ice storm or something happens, and all of a sudden it's gone. And unless it recolonizes that woodlot, it is permanently gone. That's called local extinction. And there's a lot of things like that box turtle that are not going to recolonize the woodlot. Uh, and studies all over the world are showing that uh, this is a huge problem on the planet. The natural areas we humans have left are not large enough to sustain the nature we need them to sustain. And unfortunately, that includes uh, our largest national parks. So what we're doing is we're conserving habitat fragments. Uh, but habitat fragments, um, are it's not the same thing as conserving an ecosystem. There's a, a great analogy about a, uh, a quilt. A quilt is a quilt made up of tiny little patches, but only when they're all sewed together. If you separate them, it's not a quilt anymore. And that's what, essentially what we've done to nature. Uh, well, what has fragmentation done to the biodiversity that we, we need on this planet? In most cases, we're not measuring it. Now, people in Europe are better at, at measuring things, but we're not so good at it. We do measure what's happening to birds, because a lot of people like birds. We have something called the State of the Birds Report. Two years ago, it comes out every year, but two years ago in uh, 2014, the State of the Birds Report said that we had 230 species of birds in North America that are at risk of extinction, 230 species. Just two years later, we now have 436 species at risk of extinction. That's a very steep decline there. 50% fewer songbirds today uh, compared to just 40 years ago. Now, there are, there are a lot of problems for, that birds are encountering, um, but fragmentation is certainly a major one. Our insects are in trouble as, as well. Uh, again, we're not measuring it very well in this country. Uh, Germany has, has uh, started to take some measurements. There's been a general decline of insects by a factor of five since 1989. That wasn't that long ago. 46 species of butterflies have already disappeared from Germany. Invertebrate abundance around the globe is estimated to have declined by 45% just since, since 1974. Serious, serious declines in, in insects. Uh, now, these species are our natural capital. We are fragmenting them to extinction. Now, a lot of people say, so what? You know, we, don't, we used to have National Insect Killing Week. You realize that? that was, <laughs> Yeah, we did. I can show you a newspaper article. Um, well, so what? A world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. That's, that's so what? If you want to remain on this planet, we need to keep the life around us. And insects are a major, major part of that. All right, let's just talk about how many species we do need. And the species are disappearing all the time, particularly locally, from local ecosystems. So how many do we need? The short answer, since this is only an hour talk, is that we need all of them. We need all of them. There's a lot of research to describe how we come up with that. But we need all of them because it is the species in our ecosystems, the plants and the animals that are generating what we call ecosystem services that keep us alive. That's why we humans need functioning ecosystems. We might as well call them biodiversity services, because it's the, it's the living things that are generating those, those services. They do a lot of things. They increase the stability of, of an ecosystem. The more species that are in the ecosystem, the more stable it is. The more biogeochemical processes like sequestering carbon, cycling nutrients, um, increases productivity. The more energy that's flowing through that ecosystem, supporting more life. 
Uh, and they're actually less susceptible to, to invasive species, to biotic invasions. Those are all good things that have been demonstrated from diverse, uh, very rich ecosystems. Well, the, uh, there was a millennial ecosystem uh, assessment back in 2005. Uh, hundreds of scientists from around the world spent five years studying the Earth's ability to produce the ecosystem services that support us. Their unhappy conclusion way back in, in 2005 is that we have already degraded the planet's ability to support us by 60%. That's the same as taking planet Earth and shrinking it by 60%. Of course, we keep increasing our population. That is not a sustainable relationship, folks. Um, so what we need to do is to rebuild the Earth's carrying capacity. It's not permanently gone. We can recreate it if we understand what carrying capacity is and, and what, uh, what generates it. It's a very simple definition. It's simply the, the number of individuals of a particular species that can be supported sustainably, and sustainably means forever, at least, at least in... in, in uh, ecological time, without degrading the resource base. So here, carrying capacity is, is well, let's just think of it as created by plants. Now the soil people will say, no, it's created by soil, but let's, <laughs> let's say it's created by the plants that grow in that soil. Uh, we can graphically depict it. The, the orange dotted line there would be the carrying capacity, the number of plants and diversity of plants in that ecosystem. And the yellow line is a population that's growing and cycling beneath that, that uh, carrying capacity. If you think of carrying capacity as if it were the principal in an ecological bank account, um, that make, make it easier to, to understand. It's generating interest, ecological interest. And that population is living off that interest without degrading the principal, without removing the number of plants that are there. And that's why it can go on forever. But if we do reduce the number of plants, and now you can start thinking about roadsides. Every time you mow the, the roadside, you have reduced the functional number of plants there. You've lowered the carrying capacity, and any population depending on those plants is going to be lower than that carrying capacity. And of course, if you remove all the plants, so when we build buildings and pave things, we remove all the plants, zero carrying capacity. That's why we cannot do that to the whole planet. A lot of people think we can just put New York City everywhere on the planet. That's not going to work. It's not going to work. The only reason New York City and Beijing and all these other big cities can exist is because there's enough natural areas, other places, generating the ecosystem services that all those people need. Got to keep those around. So we're back to fragmentation. We fragmented uh, nature into these little habitat patches. They are small. They are isolated. And that reduces the ecological principle out there that used to generate the interest that everything, including us, depended on. So this fragmentation is what lowers the carrying capacity of the planet, which means the solution uh, that has been proposed is to build biological carters that connect those isolated habitat fragments. And that's how people, people might draw it. Um, and of course, if you connect those isolated habitat fragments, those patches are no longer isolated, which means the populations within them are no longer tiny. So when they fluctuate, they will no longer disappear. So in theory, building these, these connections between these habitat fragments is the single most powerful thing we can do to maintain, to stop the steady drain of, of uh, species from our, our ecosystems. Now, there are convenient ways to do that, to build these carters. Uh, mountain ridges, riparian carters, power lines. We'll talk about roads, of course. Range lands, things people don't usually think about. Uh, mountain ridges, now you don't have too many of those in, in Florida, but this is Pennsylvania. You know, if I, if I float up from my house and I look down on, on the Appalachian Mountains, that's what it looks like. Uh, and the green areas, of course, are the areas that have not been, where, where the ecosystem has not been eliminated. All the, the tan areas in there, that's the, the development in the valleys and the, in the Appalachians. So those, those mountain ridges are too steep. Uh, to build on conveniently, uh, and they're no good for farming. So although they were totally logged around the turn of the century, 19, 1900, they've regrown, and they form very nice connectivity. They're, they're, they're um, wonderful avenues for migrating birds to move along. A lot of wildlife live in those, those carters. And it forms connectivity over, um, well, tens, sometimes hundreds of, of miles. Excellent opportunity for, for uh, connecting habitats. How about riparian carters? Those are the areas along our streams and our rivers. What you're looking at there in the middle is a uh, 
It's a little tributary going into the Susquehanna River. That's the river nearest me. Uh, it is lined with green, uh, and, and that's good. It, that, that creates a biological corridor that, that animals can move along and live in um, all the way to the end of that stream. I wish it were wider, but of course, then we have to give up some of our farmland to do that, but that is a, a functional riparian corridor. Uh, and if we had functional riparian corridors along all of our rivers and streams, and that's where they are, which is just about everywhere, we'd be done. We'd have all the connectivity we need. Uh, but of course, we don't do that. Most of the time, our, our rivers and streams have development along them. Um, in the old days, that was the transportation corridor. We built our cities there because we could move our goods up and down the, the river. Um, and, and it worked until they flooded. Um, it, it's a nice place to have a house until it floods. Uh, it's never a good place to put a, a landfill, and that's what you're looking at there on the Christiana Creek in, in Delaware. Um, or I can, I can walk to a farm down the road from me, uh, and, and I, every time it rains, I get to watch his farm wash away. This goes straight into the, to the uh, Chesapeake Bay. If we wonder why the bay is dying, that's, that's why. Um, there's absolutely no excuse for that. That has to be lined with trees to hold that soil um, so that you don't have this type of, of uh, degradation. How about power lines as convenient corridors? We have 300,000 kilometers of power line cuts in this country. That's, that's a fairly old statistic. I'm sure it's more than that now, but it's a lot. Uh, now you can look at that as it, as it moves through these, uh, those forests and say, well, that's actually creating um, isolation. It's, it's interrupting the forest habitat. And it is, uh, but if it's managed properly, it can create a habitat, which is one of the rarest habitats we have in this country, and that is scrub habitat. There are birds, there are a number of creatures that only live in scrub. The golden wing warbler is one of them, if you want to find a golden wing warbler in Pennsylvania, you've got to go to a power line cut. Uh, and if it's managed like this, where you have low shrubs and young trees, perfect habitat for them. Uh, but if it's managed like that, not so good, not so good. Uh, so there, there's uh, power line uh, companies, uh, uh, energy companies are actually um, getting better at managing their, their power lines. It's a wonderful opportunity, uh, not just for wildflowers, uh, but for scrub habitat and for a number of, of creatures that need that type of, of um, ecosystem. Rangeland, we have 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S., which is 13.3 times bigger than the state of, of Florida. Uh, this is a, an experimental range in Nebraska. Those dark things there are not buffalo. Those are, uh, they're not even bison. They're cows, they're cows, they're cattle. Uh, and all the yellow things are sunflowers. Um, I visited this, this range. Uh, it was a productive place. All the grassland birds were there. The cows were happily munching because they were managed in a way that did not overgraze it. You know, our grasslands everywhere. Everywhere, grasslands co-evolved with ungulates that ate them. So when we create meadows and restore prairies in the Midwest and everything, we're trying to do it without any kind of grazing, and the plants don't know what to do with, with that. They, uh, typically, you, you plant grasses, and they take over. All the forbs are eliminated because nothing's eating the, the grasses. So grazing has always been part of it. And if we properly manage cattle, we can actually graze in a very productive way. Uh, but most of the, you drive through the West, I mean, this is what I see most of the time, completely overgrazed, no biodiversity. That's taken on the same day, by the way. It's not a different time of year. Um, so it's, cattle are tough. You, you have to manage them very carefully or they, they overgraze when you don't get a whole lot of rain. But it's another, another opportunity. So we've got mountain ridge, there's parrying carters and power lines, range line, all could work in building the, the, these convenient uh, biological carters. Unfortunately, we don't always have convenient carters where we want them. So let's talk about roads as convenient, convenient carters. We do have roads everywhere we want them, unfortunately. This is a, a new uh, graphic that just came out. The red areas are areas where a road is within one kilometer. So look at the US there. We have roads everywhere. They're everywhere. It's very difficult to find an area that is almost road free just for, for more than a mile. And of course, those roads uh, are, are, most of them are, are managed uh, in ways that include cool season European grasses. They are, they are mowed. This is the Taconic Parkway with a very nice median strip there and, and uh, mowing on the edge. Taconic Parkway is in New York. It was uh, built 
in the 30s, I believe. Uh, and you know, the, the, the standard argument I hear is that we well, really can't develop vegetation in these median areas because uh, animals will hide there, it'll increase, and it'll increase uh, road mortality. It's too dangerous and we can't do that. Well, you know where this is? That's the Taconic Parkway, about one mile north of where that first picture was. And, I, and, and this, I, mean, I can't point here with this technology, but all the vegetation to the right, to your left over there, that's the median strip. It's a, it's a complete forest. And I think what they did was they built the road. They, it was through a patch land of, of forest and farmland. And when they hit farmland, uh, they planted grass, and they've been mowing it ever since, so 80 years now. Where there was forest, they left it. They didn't cut it down, and it's still there. And apparently, everybody isn't killed by driving through there. <laughs> 80 years. So, so this, you know, this is, there's a per that's a perfect demonstration that we actually can have plants in, in our mediums. And they have to be, you know, you want them to be biome appropriate. You don't want to try to force trees where, where uh, they shouldn't be. But it tells me that it's, it's possible. And of course, you've got your, your wonderful uh, opportunities in Florida that we're going to hear a lot about today. Um, and, and I've learned about it from, from Eleanor. Um, there are excellent opportunities to not just help the endangered plants that are out there and all of the creatures that, that use them, but to build that connectivity between uh, fragments, fragmented habitats. So you, you can look and say, well, there's a ton of habitat behind that. You know, that, that's a pine plantation for the most part. It's not being managed for biodiversity. All the biodiversity is on the side of the, of the road here. Uh, and that's connecting the, the, the herbaceous ecosystem that so many things depend on. There are a lot of uh, restoration opportunities that are actually not on the roadside, but they're still associated with roads. This is a rest stop along the Pennsylvania Turnpike in, in Pennsylvania. Acres and acres and acres of lawn, and I, I guess that's where you're supposed to walk your dog. I don't know. Uh, but it's, you know, it's mowed once a week, all the energy that goes into that, and I'm not sure anybody's thought about why. Why can't that be planted with something? You could have paths, you could still walk your dog. You know, we have looked for biodiversity <laughs> in grass. I'm not kidding, that's exactly what that study was. We were looking at grass and meadows and, and forest. I still haven't told that one girl that I show that picture. <laughs> You do, you find a few things there, but it's a fraction of what you find in any other, any other habitat. So there's lots of restoration opportunities along our, our roads. Well, um, roads are good, power lines are good, but we've got a lot of other managed built landscapes out there. Let's talk about restoring them as well to really build connectivity between those habitats that are not built by, by humans. This is a house down the street from me um, it was, it was, you know, this landscape was designed to celebrate lawn as a status symbol, uh, because, because it is. It was, it was uh, developed for convenience, uh, and although it's not very convenient to have to mow that all the time, it meets the aesthetic uh, uh, needs of this, this homeowner, but it was not developed with the idea of sharing the space with any other living thing. Um, those trees in the corner there are calorie pears, by the way. So you, I mean, if you're looking for a dead landscape, there, there it is. But it could have been. It could have been designed in a way that would support lots of life. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know this guy, but my feeling is that if he actually did that, um, he would like it. He would like it. This is very entertaining. Uh, lots of fun to actually put life into your yard. So this is our standard approach to building biological carters, but I'm going to argue it's not enough. Uh, because what we need to do in our carters is not simply, I don't like the word carter, it suggests that you're only presenting uh, wildlife or, or living things, an opportunity to move from one habit to the, to have a habitat to the next. We're doing more of that. We want to build living landscapes in between those habitats. We want to build landscapes that will actually support viable populations. So how about this for uh, another model, or this would be even better. We're going to put the plants back in between those habitats. Along the roads, we know, we know what we have to do, but we have to do the same thing in our corporate landscapes, in our yards, so that the plants are back where they belong. And that is the way we're going to save nature. We can save it, but only if we learn to live with it. We're going to give up the idea that humans are here and nature is someplace else. 
planet's not big enough anymore. As a matter of fact, it's 60% smaller now than it used to be. So we absolutely have to share. All right, what are we going to build our carters out of? You know the answer to that. We're going to build them out of plants. Uh, and the more plants we have, the more life we're going to have in our, our carters. And that is because plants are what are capturing the energy from the sun. Uh, they're turning into food. Plants allow us and everything else on the planet to eat sunlight. So we can't, we can't do without them. They also provide shelter. So they're providing the food and the shelter. Quite literally, they are a matter of life and death. If you have plants, you have the opportunity for life. If you don't, you don't. That's simple. So this is the way uh, a lot of farmland is being managed in the Midwest now. Uh, the new cultural uh, uh, status symbol as a grower in the West is to have mowed, mowed lawn. Um, the wildflowers are gone. The, they're not wildflowers. They're weeds. You know, we've got a marketing issue with our, our native plants. We call them all weeds. Joe pie weed, New York ironweed, butterfly weed. And no wonder we want to cut them down. Weeds are bad. So we need to, we need to change our, our nomenclature here. But now this is, this is growing. Um, and it's one of the major reasons that the, the uh, monarch is in trouble. It could be this. So that picture was from Iowa. This picture is also from Iowa. There, there is change in the wind. Uh, and of course, lots of, lots of life going on here. All right, so we're back to my, my favorite house here. <laughs> if we put plants back in, in these landscapes, we really can recreate functional ecosystems. Are they going to be exactly like what was there before? No, they're not. And a lot of people say, well, you can't turn the clock back. You can't build what was there before. Therefore, why do it? We want to do it because we're going to recreate ecosystem function. It may not be the exact same function that was there before, but you're going to, you're going to put functional relationships back that will move energy through our ecosystems, that will create ecosystem services, uh, and, and we will all be happier for it. All right, we're going to build our carters out of plants. Is any old plant going to work? No. It's got to be the plants that are going to share the energy they've captured from the sun. In other words, support a food web. They have to allow other creatures to eat them, at least part of them, so that that energy moves out, out the food web. On the uh, left or right, depending on where you're looking, you've got Otomala, major invasive species uh, up where I come from, with uh, native black cherry. If Otomala, if these non-native plants, whether they're invasive or not, were the ecological equivalents of the native plants they're displacing, then it really wouldn't matter in terms of ecosystem function. They would be doing the same things that our natives do. Our ecosystems would look different but they would still function just as well. So that is the question. Are these introduced plants uh, as ecologically functional as our, our native plants? And in terms of supporting insects, uh, not even close, not even close. And that's, that's what we've been doing research on for the last 10 years. Excuse me, we've got lots and lots of uh, uh, studies and data. Excuse me again. We always get the same answer. Uh, you can go read these papers if you want. I know you're not going to do that, but let's, let me just share one simple study with you. Now you're looking at, this is a, an Otomala invasion in a hedgerow. Uh, and, and what I did was got a, I got an undergraduate to compare caterpillars in invaded hedgerows with um, uninvaded hedgerows. That's what an uninvaded hedgerow looks like. But it's not just Otomala there. We've got multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and calorie pear and Norway maple and ailanthus and, and uh, burning bush and barberry and on and on and on, and every one of those is an escapee from our garden. Every one of those. And that's what the, the uh, vegetation is comprised of at this point. So what we did was compare caterpillar populations in these invaded hedgerows with uninvaded hedgerows in Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. We found five times fewer species of caterpillars in the invaded hedgerows, and 22 times fewer caterpillars, and 22 times less biomass less caterpillar biomass. So the amount of food, and biomass, by the way, is, an, is a measure of the energy moving through this, this ecosystem. Does that matter? It matters if you eat caterpillars. This is a common yellow throat. It's a male. He's trying to feed his babies. If he's, got a, if he's got to hunt in a habitat like this, that's an automal of invasion, just about a monoculture. There'll be 20 times, 22 times fewer caterpillars, less food in that habitat. And people have suggested, well, he'll just forage 22 times harder and it'll be okay. But he can't do that. He's already foraging all day long. 
156 trips a day, one trip every five minutes, he cannot forage 22 times harder. So the prediction is you'll have 22 times less bird biomass. Uh, and I actually have a, a PhD student working in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., measuring that uh, at this point. And, and that's going to that's gonna happen. You take away the food. I mean, this is not rocket science, really. Everything has to eat, and we have to have the plants that produce those, uh, all of that food. Well, why can't in insects eat any of the plants? Why aren't they eating autumn, autumn olive? Uh, and, and many of you have heard this before, but we've got to, we've got to review it. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction, so they've loaded their tissues with nasty-tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And that's why if you go out and you eat any plant outside, you're not going to like it. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste good. It's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? Well, they specialize. They specialize. Most of the specialized relationships on the planet are the relationships between insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. 90% of those insects herbivores are what we call uh, host plant specialists. They develop the adaptations that allow them to get around the chemical defenses of one or maybe two plant lineages that are sharing very similar chemical defenses. They develop the enzymes that allow them to, to uh, eat the plant and detoxify the enzyme. Life history adaptations, behavioral adaptations that allow them to avoid these compounds in time and space. But it takes a long period of exposure to those particular plant lineages for all of those adaptations to fall into place. Let me quickly use uh, red cedar, eastern red cedar as an example. I guess down here you have southern red cedar doing the same thing. It's a conifer, so it's very old. It has been in our ecosystems for, I guess, hundreds of millions of years. So these conifers have been interacting with insects ever since insects appeared on, on the planet. You would think that's plenty of time for every insect to have adapted to, to uh, eastern red cedar and be able to eat it, but not the case. Actually, not many things eat red cedar. It's found a really effective defense, toxic monoterpene called beta thuyaplixin, and it keeps most of the insects from eating it. But this is one that can. This is the uh, juniper hair streak. It is a specialist on red cedar. And all that means is it can eat beta thuyaplixin without dying. That's the upside of specialization. The downside of specialization is if we don't landscape with eastern red cedar, we don't have that butterfly, because that's all it can eat. By developing all the adaptations that allow it to get around beta thuyaplixin, it has not developed the adaptations that allow it to eat the tannins that are in oaks, or the cucurbitations in cucurbits, or the nicotine in tobacco, or the cyanide in cherry, and on and on and on. If you're going to eat red cedar, you might as well look like it. <laughs> I, I don't have a pointer here, so you have to find these things. That's the larva of the juniper hair streak. This is called crypsis, and it's another big advantage of specialization. You, you really can start to look like what you're eating um, so that all those birds that want to eat you can't, can't find you. As a matter of fact, everything that eats red cedar uh, is a specialist. There's a caterpillar in that picture. If you can't see it, here it is up close. This is the curved lined angle. And here we have the juniper geometer. This is a, a, uh, it's a specialist on red cedar that hangs out where the dead fronds are. So it blends in with the, the dead fronds. Fun with, with crypsis, but you know, today in today's world, this type of specialization has become a curse rather than a benefit. And nothing illustrates it better than, than the monarch. And you all know the story of the monarch. It, of course, is a specialist on milkweeds. We have not been very nice to our milkweeds. We've never shared our residential neighborhoods very well with them. Um, we used to have pretty good populations uh, uh, along roadsides and particularly along the edges of our agriculture. But you've seen what we're doing with our agriculture now. No more milkweeds. If we mow our, our roadsides, not going to help the, uh, the monarch. Uh, and because of this war on their host plant, the only thing they can eat, uh, they have declined 96% as of two years ago. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left. Uh, compared to 1976. This has a, been a learning experience for, for the country. Um, so there's a bright side in that all of a sudden we have an example of how important host plant specialization is if we want to bring the monarch back, and we do. It's a beautiful butterfly. We love beauty. It may be the most iconic insect in the world because it got that fantastic migration down to Mexico. So the whole nation has teamed together, realizing we need milkweeds. 
Well, there's nothing special about monarchs. Every single insect host specialist out there needs their host plant. There you go. That's why you don't have any monarchs anymore. Uh, Iowa has lost 82% of its milkweeds in the last 10 years. It's also lost the asters that, that um, monarchs need, the goldenrods, as they're, as they're flying south. You know, when they're flying south, they're not breeding on milkweed anymore. They're not using milkweed anymore. They're looking for, for forage to, to fuel that migration uh, and get them down to Mexico. I don't want you to think that it's just uh, caterpillars that are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle only eats elderberry, dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. Sumac flea beetle only eats sumac. This is a, a Korean bug that only eats ash. You've all heard the emerald ash borer taking out the ashes. If it succeeds, this insect will disappear. 95 species will disappear if we lose our, our ashes, because that's all they eat. And that's the problem that 90% of all the, the uh, Phytophagus insects that are host plant specialist. So which plants should we have in, in our landscapes? <laughs> Actually, that's, that's a list. We've been making lists for, for a long time. This is the first one we made. This is all the woody plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states. We have 1,385 plant genera in the mid-Atlantic states. These are the, the woody ones. And we rank them um, in terms of their ability to make caterpillars. Caterpillars are the most important part of our, our insect-based food webs. The little numbers after each plant genus are the number of, of species of caterpillars each one of those genera uh, support. So memorize that. <laughs> It turns out that this, this became a popular list. Everybody wanted a list. This is just the mid-Atlantic states, but everybody wanted a list. You know, where's our list for Florida? Where's our list for California, for Oregon, for Wisconsin? Um, well, the Forest Service paid my technician to make a list for every state, every county in every state. Um, she has finished. It is now launched on uh, the National Wildlife Federation website called Native Plant Finder. That's the uh, web address. It's in, in uh, beta testing form. This is, a, this is a big effort, a lot of huge Excel file. Um, so if something's not working perfectly, let us know. But uh, it seems to be working pretty good at this point. What you do is you put in your zip code, and the rank list for your county will, will come up. So that should guide you in terms of what plants are going to make the most food. It's not necessarily a guide to, to saving the wildflowers on, on, on roadways. One thing we noticed, though, which was very interesting, is that um, there was a pattern that occurred everywhere. About 5% of the genera, the plant genera, are producing about 75% of the food. I started calling them foraging hubs. I know people don't like that term, uh, but I actually borrowed it from uh, people who study the, the uh, fruit, fruiting trees in the tropics. All the birds go to eat the fruit, and they called them foraging hubs. But one day, I was sitting on a Delta airline. Um, <laughs> On the, on the tarmac, we weren't going anywhere. And I was looking at the, the Delta magazine, and those are the, those are the, the hubs for, for um, Delta Airlines. And it illustrates perfectly what I'm talking about. Let's make them foraging hubs. There we go. <laughs> now, every line going into, for example, that oak tree in the bottom, it could be a bird, it could be a species of bird, could be a lizard, something going in to forage for food on that tree. Notice all the other black dots on the map there. Those are all other species of plants in this landscape. And the birds and the lizards are going into those as well, but not very much, because there's not very much food there. So imagine what would happen if we took out the willow, the cherry, the pine, and the oak, took it out of that landscape. It's only four, four species, and all the other black dots remain. We still would have a failed food web, because most of the food is being produced by those, those big guys. For example. Oaks in the mid-Atlantic state, 557 species of caterpillars. Let's compare that to ginkgo, favorite landscape tree from, from um, Asia. Well, the literature records four species of caterpillars on ginkgo. They're all mistakes. There aren't any species of caterpillars on ginkgo. If you find a, a caterpillar eating ginkgo, take a picture of it and send it to me. <laughs> I have been saying that for years. I still have no pictures. Um, but even if those are, are good host records, you've got 557 versus four. Which one are you going to plant if you want to support the life around you? If you want to make your landscape, um, tie it into your local ecosystem. Number two on our list are, are, uh, is prunus. So black cherry, pin cherry, chickasaw plum, American plum, beach plum. 456 species of caterpillars on, on prunus. Let's compare that to zelkova. I don't know if you use zelkova down here, but we're sure using it a lot. 
uh, up north. Uh, another, it's another species from Asia. I guess we're using it because it looks a little bit like the elms we lost to Dutch elm disease. But zero caterpillars recorded on, on Zelkova. That's what the leaves always look like. If your goal is to put a plant in, in the yard that nothing will touch, it will stay completely unused forever, put a silk plant in or a plastic plant. <laughs> then you don't, you don't ever have to worry about pruning it or watering it. The drought won't matter. If it's just about aesthetics, do, do that. Pieris japonica may be the most common uh, foundation plant in the country. We have native Pieris, but this illustrates that all native plants are not producing the same amount of food. Our native Pieris are not very productive. They support two species of caterpillars. I don't think Pieris japonica supports anything. It could be a native viburnum that supports 103 species. So we're talking about choices. It could be choices along our roadsides, choices in our corporate landscapes, our parks, our houses. The plants we put in those areas are going to determine what other life can be there. Let's think of them as bird feeders. Now they are. They're bird feeders. <laughs> now we get to decide how well we're going to feed the birds. We can feed them a lot. Or we can feed them just a little bit. This is what the, the houses around me look like. There are very few plants, um, and the plants that are there are small. We can put food in those bird feeders. The, the birds aren't eating the feeders. They're eating the food in the feeders. Or we can keep them without food. That's, there's the ginkgo in the back. It's a big tree. It's a big tree, but it's not making any food. OK, we can use the knowledge about host plant specialization to actually rebuild food webs wherever we want to do it. We just have to understand what those food webs are, are built from. Um, let me give you an example. This is the white-eyed vireo. I'm going to use this as an example because that's the nest my wife found in our yard uh, a couple of years ago. It was low, so I set up my camera, took pictures of what they were bringing back to the, to the nest. If we know what the caterpillar is, we know a lot about what they eat. We can know what plant was required to make the caterpillar, and we can start to build the food web that supports wide-eyed vireo. So let's do that. This caterpillar is the blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry. Got a lot of black cherry at home making blinded sphinx moths, and the babies get to eat. This guy is the chestnut shizura, specialist on, on native viburnums. At our house, that's viburnum dentatum. Our house was mowed for, our yard was mowed for hay before we, we uh, came. So we know the plants that are there because they're the ones we, we have put. We put in viburnum dentatum. It is making chestnut scissors, and the babies get to eat again. This guy is the drab prominent, specialist on sycamore. Now, we didn't plant sycamore, but we had a big wind maybe 13 years ago. Blew in some sycamore seeds from someplace. One of them landed in my cold frame and germinated. And I'm not very fast at weeding things out. It's now about 40 feet tall. <laughs> but it's making drab prominence, so the babies get to eat. On and on we go. This is the eight-spotted forester moth, a, a specialist on native grapes. We have lots of those. The lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. This is the spice bush swallowtail. You see its little eye there? It's supposed to, to scare the, the bird into thinking it's a tree snake. Didn't work. It's a specialist on spice bush and sassafras, close relative. We have both of those. Tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherry has emerged as a really important component of this bird's food web. These guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's give them some black walnut. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the great edge bomaloka, the black blotch caesura, the bride. Those are all specialists on, on uh, black walnut where I come from. We have native maples. We have Plagodes inchworms, green striped maple worm, retarded dagger moth, native elms, four horned sphinx, double tooth prominent, and many others. Violets, if we have violets, we will get our fritillaries. You're not going to get them without them. Remember, 90% of the insects that are going to be part of this food web will not be there if we don't put the plants uh, that they have grown to depend on over the, the eons. So if we want the hackberry emperor, we need hackberry. If we want Cuculio asteroides, we need native asters. We want the arcidra flower moth and the brown hooded owlet. Come back here, brown hooded owlet. We need goldenrod. If we want the hog sphinx, the Pandora sphinx, the abbot sphinx, we need Virginia creeper. Red bud leaf roller needs red bud. The gray furcula needs native willows. The turbulent phosphilla needs green briar. And the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the pleasant dagger moth, the delightful dagger moth, 
the lesser rogue dagger moth, the greater rogue dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the white black heterocantha, the oblique heterocantha, the red line panopoda, the leper, and many, many more will not be there if you don't have oaks. Because in most landscapes, those are the most important things. And by the way, I took every one of those pictures in my front yard, not my backyard. The reason I emphasize that is I hate the term backyard habitat. It implies what we're talking about is so ugly, we have to hide it in the backyard. And it's not. It's not. So we can't build effective carters if we ignore all those specialized relationships that create all of that food. And all those specializations start with plants. Why do we want all these insects in our, our carters? Because so many animals rely on them. They're the things transferring the energy to most of the other food web. All spiders eat insects, or they eat other spiders that eat insects. A lot of people don't like spiders, but it's the second most important component of bird food webs. You can't lose them. We have the insect predators eating the insect herbivores. If we lost the herbivores, we'd lose those predators. They, in turn, are part of food webs. If we lost our insects, we'd lose our frogs, our toads, all of our amphibians, because they all eat insects. We'd lose our lizards, we'd lose our bats, we'd lose our rodents because they're all eating insects. Everybody thinks of rodents as seed eaters, and they do eat seed when they can't find enough insects. And the reason they're eating is insects are really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in other, other uh, as in beef, for example. And they have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that allow those little guys to grow quickly, reproduce quickly. And if you're a chipmunk, that's what you want to do, because there's so many things that want to eat you. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are eating, eating insects. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your lawn. This is my, my it's almost my pet, comes to our back porch every, every night to see what we put out for him. But possums eat a lot, of, a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like red foxes. 25% of a red fox's diet is insects, full quarter. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects. So it doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. Even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk. It eats birds. You might think, well, I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have, have sharp shin hawks. But you can't, because the birds this guy's eating needed insects to become birds. He needs them indirectly. So does the garter snake. He's not eating insects directly. He's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on, on insects. How many? How many do we need if we're going to create viable food webs in our carters? Let's look at the Carolina chickadee to answer that question. A lot of people think of them as seed eaters, but when they're reproducing, they're not seed eaters. They're feeding their young caterpillars. As a matter of fact, if they're in a healthy environment, they feed their young exclusively on, on caterpillars. And in fact, that is what most of the birds that rear their young insects are doing. It's caterpillars. So let's quickly ask the question, why caterpillars? What is special about caterpillars? Could be because they're beautiful. I love beautiful caterpillars, like the Pandora Sphinx, that curved line outlet that you looked at, Coletta silk moth, spiny rose caterpillar, our black swallowtail, beautiful, hieroglyphic moth, the spun glass caterpillar, that's my favorite. Or it could be because they have cool names, <laughs> like the green marvel, the once charred punky, the confused wood grain, the cynical ground cat, the neighbor, the Donald. <laughs> I had to squeeze it. Actually, I don't think it's because they're pretty or they have cool names. There's some very practical reasons. They're soft. They're soft. So you can stuff them down the throat of your, of your baby without fear of injuring their, their esophagus. That's important. They're, they're also large. You realize it takes 200 aphids. You have to eat 200 aphids to equal one small caterpillar if you're a bird. Which are you going to want, the caterpillar or the aphids? And they're nutritious. They're high in protein. They're high in, in lipids and fats. And they're the best source of carotenoids. Who cares about carotenoids? Well, we all have to. Carotenoids, that's a carotenoid. They are essential components of diets. And we vertebrates don't make them. The chickadee doesn't make them. We don't make them. And that's why Cindy tells me I have to eat my, my carrots to get my beta carotene. I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is up in the corner there to get my lutein. And she makes sure I eat all that stuff. We need carotenoids because they're antioxidants. They run around our body. 
and they, re they either pre repair or prevent DNA from being uh, ox damaged through oxidation. They stimulate the immune system, so we're generally healthier. They improve our, our vision, our color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you'll see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but she, she was right. Improves sperm vitality, who doesn't need that? Improves sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about the birds. They take the pigments from the carotenoids and put them in their feather. This vermilion flycatcher is red because he's put carotenoid pigments into his feathers. And the brighter red he is, the more lady friends he has. Well, chickadees uh, can't make their own carotenoids, so they have to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants when they're rearing their young. So they have to get them from something that does eat plants, and here's the key. Caterpillars have twice as many carotenoids as other types of insects and spiders. We don't know why, but they do, which means um, they are, they're probably not optional for bird diets. They're essential. They're essential. And that means if you're a chickadee and you're trying to rear your young, you won't be able to do it if you're in a habitat that doesn't have enough caterpillars. So that's, we're back to that question. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? A lot. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. And they're a tiny bird. Third of an ounce. That's four pennies. Four pennies worth of chickadee. What if I want to make a red-bellied woodpecker? It's eight times heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? And we don't want just chickadees and red-bellied woodpeckers in our neighborhoods. We want scarlet tanagers and tip mice, all these common birds, blue, blue jays. There's our yellow throat, our bluebirds, and our tree swallows. The yellow throat came back. Huh. Our indigo bunning, towhees, uh, yellow warblers, our thrushes, our wrens, our cardinals, our hummingbirds. Think how many caterpillars it takes to, to keep populations of these guys going in our neighborhood. We all expect them to be there, but we're not thinking about what it requires. And that includes hummingbirds. 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders. And spiders needed insects to become spiders. So again, imagine the number of insects required to support these, these food webs. Is this type of landscape going to support the food web? Um, not, not very well. Uh, so, boy, how am I doing on time? Am I? Am I killing this whole conference here? <laughs> okay, we'll keep going. You know what we've done is we've turned we've turned the the well we turned the country into Gone with the Wind here. We, we've we've landscaped for aesthetics. Uh oh, here comes Eleanor. Oh, good. But plenty of time. Aesthetics. That, that is, you know, to a lot of people, that is, I mean, that's a very southern looking landscape there. Um, but is it going to, to create the ecosystem services that, that we all need? No, it wasn't designed to, to do that. We have to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do, and that includes our roadside landscapes. In the past, we've asked them to be pretty. Now we have to ask them to also support life both the wildflowers and all the things they support. They have to sequester carbon. We've got way too much carbon in the air, folks, and a third of it has come from removing the plants on this planet. We hear about fossil fuels all the time. Sure, that's a problem, but cutting down, our, we've, we've cut down half the forests on the planet. All of that carbon is up in the air. Every time we plow the ground, we release 70% of the carbon in the, in the soil. We have to get the carbon back in the soil. Our soils can, support, can sequester seven times the total amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. We don't have to look for geoengineering and put up mirrors in space and everything. Just put the carbon back in the soil. What does that? Plants. Plants. And roadside plants, meadow plants, do it wonderfully. A lawn sequesters 120 pounds of carbon per acre per year. A meadow sequesters 3,000 pounds of carbon per hectare or per acre per year, and a forest sequesters 3,500. So uh, the, your roadside um, flowers are supporting, are sequestering almost as much carbon as the trees next to them because they've got deep roots and they're, they're funneling it all into the ground. We also have to plant as if we're managing our watershed. Everybody lives in a watershed. Every one of us lives in a watershed. Which one of us has the right to landscape in a way that does not manage that watershed shed in a productive way? And of course, it's plants that are doing that. Enrich our soil, we'll put the carbon back, and support our pollinators. You know, it's, it's politically correct to talk about pollinators now. So let's do it a little bit. Um, and if I said, why do we need pollinators? The answer I would hear, I guarantee it, is that they pollinate our crops. They do, a third of our crops. But that's not the answer. That's not the answer. We need our pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. 
If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. It's simply not an option. We are not talking about good land stewardship. We are talking about essential land stewardship. This should be taught from the very first time we open a book to our, our kids. And I still can't, I can't believe we didn't hear about it in the, the presidential debates. <laughs> this, this is my neighbor's house. Um, we both bought 10 acres the same month, moved in the same month, planted plants the same month. Um, on his 10 acres, every plant he put on the 10 acres is, is an out-of-towner. It's an introduced plant. That's a calorie pear, highly invasive. He's got 30, 32 of them. And the reason he did that is he's landscaping like everybody else. When you go to the, to the nursery to buy a plant, you do it to create a beautiful landscape. That has been the culture for 100 years. So you're looking for a pretty plant. Maybe it could be a screen, an anchor, or a focal point. But nobody's thinking about the ecological roles that those plants uh, have to play. So the, 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 there's no balance there in the way we're designing our landscapes. There could be, though. We can find pretty plants that do have food web value, that are protecting our watersheds, sequestering our carbon, helping the pollinators, doing all those, creating those ecosystem services that we all need. So how do we do that? What does a biodiversity landscape, friendly landscape look like? Well, this is where we get back to Carter's. We've got to connect those isolated habitat fragments. Where are we going to put all of the plants that I'm talking about? Well, I suggest we put them in lawn. We've got 45.6 million acres of lawn in the US, and that includes our, our roadsides. We're still adding 500 square miles of lawn to the US every year, and we're doing that because it's a status symbol at home. It's easy to maintain um, in other places. But we can change status symbols. I went to, to uh, Montana a couple of years ago, and I looked around, and they did not have big lawns. And I asked my host, where are your big lawns? And he said, well, we only get nine inches of rain a year. But he, he said, lawn is not our status symbol. I said, well, what is your status symbol? And he thought, and he said, big belt buckles. <laughs> And I think that's the answer. I think that's the answer, because if we doubled our butt belt buckles and cut the size of our lawn in half, we would be done. And of course, we need to put the plants that are going to support all that life into these biological carters. This is the way we've landscaped in the past. We've, we've built our houses, put in a foundation planting, a few trees here and there. Everything by default becomes lawn. We're tired of landscaping, so we plant our, our lawns. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build the house and now figure out where we do want turf grass. Turf grass is the perfect plant to walk on, so let's figure out where we're going to walk. I look at where my neighbors walk on their 10 acres, and it's mostly lawn. Nowhere. They're never outside, never walking. But let's say you want to get married in the front yard. You need a, you need a, a little grass patch there. If you want to walk to the, to the backyard, you need a path. If you're going to throw the frisbee or have a barbecue in the back, that's where the lawn goes. Then everything else, by default, becomes heavily planted. This has got to become the new landscape design paradigm. Uh, and for landscape designers, if, if you have any, if there are any in the room here, we have to figure out how to do this without it looking wild or, or messy, because our culture says that's, that's not good. We can do that if we convince our neighbors to do that. Then we've got the connectivity that connects with the woodlot over here and the woodlot over there. Not only have you stopped the steady drain of species from your neighborhood, you've reversed it. They will, they will start to come. We still have lawn. We can still play with our lawnmowers, so it will be OK. <laughs> And if we replace half the lawn in the US, let's say we've got 40 million acres, make the math simple, cut it in half, we can build a new national park that will be 20 million acres in, in size. We're going to do it largely at home, so we'll call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than, than 20 million acres. And don't ask me why the Everglades is in there. I just got to 20 million acres before I got to it. Uh, so let's do that. Let's do that. Let's take areas like this. Now, here's, here's a median strip leading to the entrance to the Toledo Zoo uh, with its nice lawn and, and dandelions. Um, it, could be, it could be this. Uh, and you know, when the zoo did this, the board went crazy. They said, nobody's going to come to the zoo anymore. They want the grass strip, so we'll see if that happens. Let's take areas that look like this and, and turn them into this. We're simply putting the plants back. 
So we're throwing out the idea that nature's, that humans are here and nature's someplace else. Now we're going to be together. This is a house in the, the Rio Grande Valley of, of Texas, typical landscaping. Right next door is a totally native landscape. Um, I should have found a better angle because it actually was, was quite attractive and all the plants were there. We could take these square things and turn them into a high-end landscape. This is on Fisher's Island. This is where the Roosevelt's live. I wish I included more of the house, very fancy house. But this is a landscape that's doing everything I was talking about, except supporting the pollinators. So let's put in a pollinator garden, too. And then we do that. By the way, when you plant for pollinators, you plant for pollinator specialists. The generalists will follow. Find out what the specialists are in your area, plant those plants, and then we've got 4,000 species of native bees. They're all in trouble. So we need to plant for the specialists. Don't worry about the generalists. They'll follow. This is a mulch sculpture that uh, proves you can't use native plants formally. Except that's, that's nobody told the, the folks in, in uh, Indianapolis this is an all native planting in a very formal garden in a park in the middle of the city. Of course, it's an urban legend. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in that design. Our native plants are used in formal gardens in Europe all the time, and that's OK, because they're not native over there. <laughs> this is a corporate landscape can, that, that invites the employees to come out at noon to get sunburned. Could be a, a lovely setting like this. And there's interesting research that shows if you spend 15 minutes in a landscape like this, there are measurable medical benefits. Your blood pressure goes down. Your cortisol, your stress hormone goes down. Your cancer is cured. You don't get divorced anymore. <laughs> And the reason I say that is that the studies are showing you get the same medical benefits that you get from intense meditation, which has been shown to boost your immune system. It also renews your attention span. When you go out, and you settle yourself, you commune with nature just for a short period of time, all of the stress that is accumulated during the day tends to disappear. So when you go home that day, you don't yell at your spouse. But you can't. You can't go to Yellowstone for two weeks in the summer and expect that to last the rest of the year. You have to be exposed to this every day. And the only way to do that is to either live in an area like that or work in an area like that or visit an area like that. But it's got to be every day. So let's put another ball up there called mental health. We can call it physical health. If we put a plant outside of a hospital room, the patient gets better faster. If you put a plant outside of a classroom, test scores go up. And for years, people are scratching their heads. Why is that? And it, apparently, it's the connection with stress. When you lower stress, we do everything better. We do everything better. You also uh, um, add at least three things to your landscape, to your life that may not be there uh, at this point. Surprise, anticipation, and entertainment. By surprise, I mean you can't walk into a landscape like that without seeing something you didn't expect to see. Or a landscape like that. You're going to see something you didn't expect to see. Look at your liatris flowers. Look at them closely. You might see the camouflage looper that is busy snipping off the petals and gluing them to his back so he looks just like a liatris flower. Maybe you see the puss caterpillar with his cute little top knot. How cute is that? Or the, the evening primrose moth. You'll see that hiding in the evening primrose flowers. That's where they spend the day. Maybe you'll see that dead leaf at the top there, which is actually a caterpillar. That is the caterpillar of the showy emerald. Beautiful moth right there. Maybe you see the fawn sphinx. I think this is art in the garden. And this is one of those ash specialists. If the ash disappear, this beautiful caterpillar will disappear as well. Maybe you'll see the spingicampa caterpillar. <laughs> you know, I show this to adults, uh, and they say, ooh, is it, is it going to sting me? I show it to my three-year-old granddaughter, Zoe, and she says, ooh, is it tickly? It is not going to sting you, and it is tickly. Anticipation. You can, you can know when the seasons have changed by what's happening in your yard. Uh, and at our house, it's, we know spring has come when toads start to sing, when the woodcock comes and, and displays. And we anticipate that. I go on a trip like this, and I, and I call up Cindy. Have the toads sung? Have the toads sung? And she says, no, 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 no. And then finally, yes. And it's a wonderful day because it's a message of hope. It shows that nature is still, still happening. And as a matter of fact, nature is happening where it didn't used to happen. There, there was no toad singing in our property before we made a little pond. Um, there was no, no white line sphinx pollinating or in evening primrose because we had no evening primrose. Uh, we know that the fall has come when, when juncos show up. And maybe they used to show up before we got there. I don't know. But that's our little calendar. Entertainment. We, I've got a bottle brush buckeye bush. I, I walked by it two years ago. 17 swallowtails flew up. 
You can't walk through a cloud of 17 swallowtails without a, a smile on your face. How do you know when you've succeeded? There's countless ways to know, but this has got to be part of it. When you have holes in your leaves, when you have holistic gardening, because <laughs> that's a shingle oak leaf, and if it, if it hadn't passed on part of its energy to a caterpillar, which is now in the belly of a, of a bird, there would be no caterpillar and bird on that, on that landscape. Um, so this plant is willing to pass its energy on. If, it's not, if all of your plants have no, no feeding damage at all, you've got a dead landscape. So that's, that's not what we're after. A lot of people say um, the fireflies are gone. I don't, see, I don't see fireflies or lightning bugs the way I used to when I was young. You know, they're not flies and they're not bugs, they're beetles, that's the adult beetle. Uh, and they breed, the larvae are in leaf litter on the ground. They eat, they eat uh, worms and other arthropods in leaf litter. So if you rake up all your leaf, if you neaten up so that there's no leaf litter on the ground, no hope for, for uh, fireflies. If you have chemlon poisoning everything on the ground, you won't have fireflies. If you have a security light on all night long, you're messing up their, their uh, communication with each other, with their clashes. So if you have fireflies, if your neighborhood has fireflies, you're doing several things right. And of course, if you have breeding birds, because you can't have breeding birds unless you have the food to support them. It's the best measure that, that I know of. So we can save, again, save nature, but only if we learn to live with it. I'm gonna leave you with, with a, an example right here from Florida uh, that I really like. Um, this is the Atala butterfly, and residential landscaping in South Florida by Miami accidentally saved this butterfly from extinction. This is a Lycaenid. It's beautiful as an adult. It's beautiful as a larva. It is beautiful as a chrysalis, and many of you know it is a specialist on Kunti, which you have planted right here on, on all around. I see Kunti. Um, it's an extreme specialist. It's the only plant it will eat. Well, Kunji has a lot of starch in its roots, and the Seminole Native Americans used to use it as a source of starch when the, the settlers came. They taught the settlers, hey, use Kunji for starch, and they did. Around 1900, somebody said, hey, let's start a starch industry. The 1908, I think it was, census in Miami, you have to put down your occupation. 80% of the people in Miami put down starch gatherer as their occupation, and they did. They gathered all the starch. They eliminated kunti from the wild. There were some plants in, in uh, gardens, but it was essentially eliminated from the wild. Uh, and of course, so was the Atala butterfly. Well, in 1973, we got the Endangered Species Act. There was a desperate attempt to find some Atalas so they could get some, some, they could call it an endangered species, then get federal funding to try to save it. But nobody could find it anywhere. So instead, they got it officially listed as extinct. But about then, the horticultural trade recognized Kunti as a valuable landscape plant. It's a low-growing evergreen shrub that does well in the soils of South Florida, so they started promoting it. And you get these big Kunti plantings, like we have right around this, this building, and guess who showed up again? I used to say nobody knows where it came from, but somebody told me recently, apparently they found a, a remnant population on one of the keys that came out and is now colonizing Kunti. I don't know if it's gonna get this far north, but you've got what it needs. Um, if, if it does come north. And that's what I love about this example. It truly was an accident. They never got the Atala listed as an endangered species. They never got one dime of conservation money, uh, which is good, because we don't have very many dimes of conservation money. The only thing they did was add one species of plant to the palette of plants used in common landscaping, and the butterfly saved itself, which shows it's a very powerful form of conservation. If we can save this butterfly by accident, think what we could do if we made conservation a conscious goal of landscaping, and that includes roadsides. I think it's gonna work. I think it's gonna work because nature has proven to be a lot more malleable and resilient and forgiving than, than I ever thought she would be. But I can guarantee she is not endlessly forgiving. There's a point at which she's not gonna, not gonna bounce back. But I think she's gonna give us one more chance. And remember what the Donald says, make America native again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ellen says we do have time for some, some questions. If anybody has any questions, yes. 
You know, they're taping this, and I'm supposed to be passing this around so we can hear the questions. Um, so while I do that, you're saying carrying capacity is an out-of-date term? I did not got this in plan, Yeah, a lot of folks kind of, that's an old term, and there were folks saying there's a new term or something. I see you have it right there in the front. I do have it right there. I don't know about any, any new terms. Um, People have thought two 